Hi, I'm Rob. And I'm Ashley. And this is Life Rewired. Today, joining us, we have Jennifer Schulke. And Jennifer, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. We're going to let you go ahead and tell your story. I understand you have a little bit of background before you get to your story. So go ahead and share that with us. You have the floor and then we will ask you some questions when you're finished. Sounds good. It all started when I met my ex fiance, Adam. Um, I first met him when I was 18 and he was still 16. Um, I'm actually 35 now, but uh, we started out as friends and I had really liked him ever since I met him really. Although for many years, we, um, you know, didn't really talk or anything. And then back in 2020, he had gotten a hold of me out of the blue and basically said that um, he essentially wanted me and I had liked him. So we started hanging out more at that point. And then, um, <clears throat> yeah, like uh, I started, you know, staying the night over with him at his dad's place every once in a while. And then it was about, I want to say a month later in uh, 2020, I uh, told him that I wanted to be with him, like uh, exclusively. And then he told me, even though he's living with his dad, he told me he had a place out in Grand Junction. It's um, a little town here in Iowa. And it was... Uh, he wasn't living there because he didn't want to live there by himself with his kids. So, and he said that it was pretty mm. trashed. He said that it was his ex that trashed it. Um, and I went out there and realized it was really bad. So I, he let me essentially live there first and help clean up the place before him and the kids moved back out there. And then, so it was mm. about probably a few weeks to a month after that when they moved out there. So he, um, he put on a really good front at the beginning of the relationship. He was really sweet and considerate at first, confident. He had primary custody of his kids. Talked about how great of a dad he was to both of those kids. And of course, initially, I believed him. I didn't know, I didn't see his interactions as much with his kids at that point. It was after about being with him for, for about a year and a half that I really started noticing things starting to change with them. Uh, particularly when he was drinking, he had become a completely different person. So there's nights where it was essentially up to me solely to make sure that the kids were fed, especially when he was completely drunk. He would look through my phone and he would look through my diary sometimes. It started out, you know, not being very often that he did that, but over time, it escalated to emotional and verbal abuse, like, and then huh. eventually it went to physical after about, I'd say the year and a half to two years that I was with them is when that, when that physical abuse started. And then that only happened every once in a while at first. Um, <clears throat> but then over time, um, at about two, being together about two years, it started getting to be more serious physical abuse. And that was when I noticed he would be more, f like, do stuff more physically with his kids, too. Um, <clears throat> oh, wow. To eventually, um, it started be being more serious physical abuse as well, T turning into, mm. every once in a while, being uh, strangled. <laughs> And then I, oh gosh, yeah, and periodic strangling. And then he would threaten, be he would like act and be threatening with um, his knives or using my gun even to be more um, like a, uh, I guess just essentially threatening. And um, he would act like he would act more combative talking and acting in ways that were more mean, like, in my opinion, compared to how he was before, initially, before everything started happening. And a lot of times, it there was really no warning. 
as to when it was going to happen. Although the only warning that I've had sometimes was if he started like, you know, talking more combatively or um, sometimes I see his eyes like turn practically a black and his eyes are blue. Mm. There's only really a few, t- few times that I saw something set him off, mm. but not always. Um, <clears throat> like, yeah. And then for one of the examples, like I, one of the examples I saw something set him off to act like out physically was my cat when she was one one of my cats freya when she was a little kitten she bit him really bad she was only kitten and it ended up causing him to bleed and he ended up that ended up setting him off really bad and um so when he when that happened um i saw him hold my cat up to the running shower head um holding her, like, kind of at her, like, neck, holding her like that, holding her up to the shower head. And actually, his daughter was there, too, and she was actually freaking out at that time, too, because we were um, both trying to keep him from doing that, but he is um, he's definitely way stronger than me, <laughs> needless to say. Um, he just, uh, you know... The type of uh, guy he was, he minimized it by saying that she wasn't hurt, you know, that she's still fine. There's, you know, she's not seriously hurt or anything. He just didn't want her to, you know, end up biting the kids eventually. That still was very concerning to me when it happened. Um, I was also not only concerned about the well-being for my cats, but I was also concerned about the well-being of his two kids. Especially when I wasn't there, and if I knew he was going to be drinking, then I literally, yeah. I really didn't even feel safe uh, leaving him alone with the two kids when he was drinking. I've, um, I've been like, you know, say I've been one of the few female role models that's pretty, pretty consistently been around them ever set for the past three years. Um, <clears throat> so, and I've, uh, I've seen Adam get really mad at the kids when he's been drinking and in my opinion i think he would excessively punish them especially when he's been drinking i've even seen one of the biggest concerns i had was the fact i'd seen him put his hands on both the kids necks before too and that had me concerned and had me concerned about their well-being um but of course he was uh, the issue was he, was he was smart enough that he knew, like, not to leave marks, and he rarely ever did leave marks on them. So that was where, uh, like, I contemplated calling DHS on him before, but he threatened me, like, that if I were to ever call DHS on him, then he, then I would never see the kids again, and he would break up with me and make sure I never saw the kids again, so... I was, uh, and I was also concerned that with the lack of marks on them, that they wouldn't believe me anyway. So I never right. did call, you know, on them because of that fact. And this, unfortunately, he is just in general, um, Adam was really manipulative. He would manipulate me to get Doa to the station to get alcohol for him, even when he was already drunk. He would sometimes use my cats by threatening to, you know, let him outside if I didn't go get more alcohol for him. And there was uh, at least two times where he actually on me. Yeah, that was definitely one of the most disgusting things ever. Those, the times he did that was actually not too long before, before the situation happened. It still was disgusting. I had to take a shower and try to, like, do what I could to clean up, you know, with where he urinated on me, which at least a couple of times I was on the bed, too, so I was just lucky that not much of it got on the bed itself, because uh, otherwise that was just, Gosh. yeah, because there's no way I would have been able to really clean up the mm. bed very well from that. He'd also use, uh, like, weapons. He'd threaten to use his weapons and use the, that to manipulate me as well to 
just to do what he wanted me to do, whether it's go and get him alcohol or do whatever, essentially. Um, There's even one night that he actually cut my arm with one of his knives. It was actually a pretty deep cut, but <laughs> I still got a scar from it on my arm. He he tried he tried saying no, it's a dull knife, so it's not going to cut. <laughs> but I I was kind of I was just thinking, oh my gosh, like the because even if there were a dull knife, sometimes the dull knives actually cut worse than the undull knives. <laughs> but he um, right. he still cut my arm anyway. <laughs> It was just one of those things he just freaking did out of, you know, like he just kind of did out of the blue. (laughs) And, um, but yeah, I could, it's actually, uh, it's crazy. It's it's still a pretty decent, uh, uh, scar from it. But, um, then there was one, there was one night where he was drinking. He, he did tell me that he, uh, wanted to kill me, but. I kind of um, just took it as like a joke when, like after he said that, he didn't really do anything necessarily against me. So that's when I thought, well, maybe he's, maybe he's just, you know, joking. He's just trying to like get, you know, something off out of his mind or something like that type of thing. Um, but yeah, and then. Um, because I both besides that, I know sometimes he joked around with random things after, you know, just when he's drunk anyway. So I think, well, part of it is kind of like yeah. I want to believe it's just a joke anyway. In fact, um, yeah. after everything had happened, I, his dad, I'm still in contact with his dad. His his kids, Adam's kids, are with him. Um, I'd even found out from his dad that. Apparently one night Adam jo- called his dad up and told him that he accidentally shot me. Like this was literally like a month or two before he shot me, before this incident. Oh my. <laughs> so I thought that was, and I thought that was pretty, that's pretty crazy. And I, and I don't recall actually being there for that myself. I was here to hear him say that. So I had no clue until his dad told me. Now, there was a number of times, like, before that night that he choked me, though, and he always minimized it by trying to say that he was teaching me a lesson for something or another. Half the time, I would ask him what the lesson was, and he's he couldn't even tell me. So I'm just kind of like, no, you make no sense. But yeah, so now, um, getting to, like, the day of February 4th, yeah, 2023, when this happened. Um, so, essentially that day, um, it was in that early afternoon, I believe. I went, I was going to my old classmate's uh, cancer benefit for that she was throwing for her husband over the next town over, essentially. Um, <clears throat> so, I t- yeah. Adam told me that he didn't want to go. So, I was like, fine. Well, I told him I was going to go anyway myself, even if he didn't want to go. Because I wanted to be there supportive of her and her husband. <laughs> and uh, then, then when I, uh, so I spent time over there. I was over there for probably a good, um, I, want to, I want to say about two hours, roughly. And then when I got back home, or well, when I was heading back home, I talked to him on the phone prior to leaving. He told me to pick up some beer for him from the station. So I was like, oh, okay, whatever. So I went and got this beer for him, and uh, and then when I got home, I realized he was gone. So I called him and that fi- to find out where he was, and, and um, I put the beer in the refrigerator, and then he told me when I finally got a hold of him that he was at the neighbor's house, and that he wanted me to stop over at the neighbor's house and bring one of the beer one of the beers I got with me. So I did that because honestly I learned earlier on not to not to fight with him when it comes to alcohol. <laughs> to just to let him do it. Because huh. um, otherwise he'd get upset. And um, I did fi- I did have a feeling when I initially talked to him that he was already drunk. And I 
got there, when I got there to the neighbor's place, I realized that the neighbor had offered him some of the absinthe that she has over there. So, um, I got there and I kind of figured just that how he was slurring his words and everything and how belligerent essentially he was, that he had already been drinking for a while before I got there. And with, I knew I've had absinthe before, so I know how strong it is. And I figured he had to have had at least a number of shots of it. And then when I was actually already there, he throughout the, I think it was probably a period of like one to two hours, he had five more shots of absinthe. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I could tell uh, after a little while of being there that he started to get like, get agitated. But particularly when she told him that she didn't want him to drink any more for absinthe. And uh, so, because she started, and then she started getting annoyed about him being all belligerent and just kind of acting and talking crazy, essentially. And that was, after, that was when he started actually getting kind of physical with her. He started to lay his hands on her. And by that point, I knew that we needed to go, but it still, after that, it still took me probably about 10, 15 minutes or so to actually convince him to, that we need to leave and to actually get him out of there. Um, and so then we finally got home. We got to the front door. It took me a bit to find the key for the house. And he started actually kind of getting impatient. And then he started trying to kick the front door. He started kicking the front door. And thankfully, I got my key out and got the door open before he was able to damage the front door by kicking it. And then when we got home inside, we went upstairs to the bedroom. I got changed into my pajamas um, and sat on the... I can't remember exactly... Um, when, but I got, when I got changed in my pajamas, then we sat on the edge of the bed. After we got there, Adam insisted I bring out my gun because we, I always kept it like, um, underneath the cushion, underneath the mattress. <laughs> and, um, I, I'd actually had like one or two shots of absinthe that night myself, so I really didn't want to bring it out, but, I kept trying to tell him I'd rather not, but he kept um, he kept being insistent and telling me that I had to I had to bring it out, and I was didn't really want to see what would happen if I didn't. So I I uh, picked it up and just put it on my end table because I wanted to handle it as little as possible because I'm the type of person I know better than to handle a gun when you've been drinking. Um, yeah. So. Uh, um, I'm trying to remember where I'm at. <laughs> and so, yeah, he insisted on bringing out my gun. Um, so, because, yeah, I, at first I tried to just point it out to him, but he said I had to take it out. The, he didn't want to pick the, He didn't want to pick it up mm. from the, underneath the mattress, so I had to. That was basically why I brought out the storage paws, because I just wasn't, I didn't want him to, like, hurt me. Mm for because I didn't want to bring my gun out. By that time he was sitting on the edge of the bed. So at some point, I think when I was trying to get up, he like had grabbed my pajamas and ended up like essentially ripping them off of me. So then I just I sat down again. I don't remember exactly when, I just know before he shot me, at some point he started like he punched me on my thigh because I was kind of like essentially put myself in like a field position trying to keep him from like hurting any other parts of my body essentially. It was after that that he uh, then put his arm around my neck and put me in a chokehold when he was sitting next to me. After a little bit I started feeling like I was going to pass out. First I tried getting like my arm in between my neck and his arm. That didn't work. I tried like just kind of scratching him because I guess I just I didn't want to like hurt him hurt him so I just tried scratching him just in case something serious were to happen essentially like if, for example like if I 
then survive, I guess, is what I was thinking. Then I would at least, then at least that DNA would be there. So when that didn't work, I just um, essentially decided just to let myself go limp and hope that he, like, let go at that time. After a while, after a bit, he did let go. But by that point, though, I was feeling pretty lightheaded, like from, I could tell there was that lack of oxygen. I was feeling really lightheaded. And a lot, next thing I knew, I saw him holding my gun in front of me and he, right in front of my face, I saw him take the safety off of it. It's a little flip, like switch on my revolver that you just flip the thing and the safety's off of it. And then that was... Basically, the last thing that I remember happening otherwise, um, before he, um, and before I woke up on the floor, laying on the floor. So then when I woke up on the floor, I tried to get up, get myself up and realized I couldn't. My legs and my arms weren't, weren't working right. So then I asked Adam to help get me up, which thankfully he did that. Of course, at that time, I had no clue what had happened. I just knew that my body wasn't working right. My legs and my arms weren't working right. And I didn't put my hand up on my head and noticed that I was bleeding really heavily. I could hear this loud ringing in my right ear especially. I asked Adam like what had happened and he said that I hit my head on the door and I fell. So when he told me that I assumed that that was what happened at the time because I didn't know at all what had happened. I just knew I was bleeding heavily and I um, was feeling, just feeling really like, you know, that I was feeling really dizzy. <laughs> Adam said that I should try and get in the shower so he could clean all the blood off of my head. But I, whenever I tried to stand by myself, I knew I couldn't. I just kept falling down. So I told him I wasn't gone in that shower that he had to get me to the, to the bed and lay down. That's the only thing I could do. And then my head hurt really bad. And so he ended up um, getting me on the bed. He went and got a towel to put on my head. I started feeling really cold as well. I asked him to give me a blanket because I was freezing. So he covered me up. I remember him at some point laying next to me to warm me up as well. And I just told him that like with how I'm feeling and everything, I had to go to the hospital. And I asked him to call 911 for me, but he refused to. I didn't understand. I didn't understand why at the time, but he said that he would be arrested. But then he uh, threatened to kill himself. I told him not to. I didn't want him to. I realized by that point that he wasn't going to call for me, so I had to try and call. But I honestly, all I wanted to do was sleep, but I knew I needed to find my phone, so I asked him to help me find a phone. It took him a while. I think it probably took him at least 10-15 minutes, but he finally found my phone for me. I tried to dial 911, but I physically couldn't. I realized I couldn't get my him to work right so I convinced him to do that it took him took me about five ten minutes to convince him to call in one for me but thankfully he did because <laughs> he told me he's not going to talk to them so I had to uh, yeah. talk to him the most that he said on the 911 call was reminding them of what the address was where we're at because at the time, I couldn't remember the address. Then I remember um, Adam and the EMTs being there. And by that point, when the EMTs got there, I started getting sick. I told the EMTs to not let my three cats out. Thankfully, the his two kids weren't there that night. So um, I knew that they were safe, at least. And they asked if there was anyone they could call. I said my dad. And uh, then... I remember getting put in the ambulance, and that was the last thing I remember. By that point, we had been together for two and a half years. I was told next day in the afternoon, so this happened. I was told that this, when I was put in the ambulance, was about 10 o'clock that night. So when I woke up, my mom told me it was about 3 or 4 in the afternoon when I woke up. I was told 
um, that I was in a coma and on life support and that I was shot in the back of my head that night. Mm -hmm.